Hi everybody and welcome to this first interview of what I'm hoping to become an entire series on development issues related interviews. Earlier this morning I went to Frankfurt to speak to Francois Baird, who's the founder of the Fair Play movement. Maybe you can explain a little bit to us what the main issue of the Fair Play movement is, what it's all about. And mostly we stand on the side of the people to uh, try and ameliorate some of the effects that uh, irresponsible trade practices have on jobs and development in smaller countries. The fair play movement is really involved in fighting what we call crocodile trade. Uh, that, those are predatory trade practices. Uh, for instance, dumping, selling below the cost of production or even below the sales price. But by predatory trade practice, we mean more, much more than that. As I'll give you a practical example. When in South Africa you buy imported frozen chicken pieces, what you will find is that uh, the origin of chicken could be in one pack, could be 11 different countries. So there's no traceability. Uh, and we think that's a risk and that's a predatory trade practice because South African chicken producers have to have full traceability. Uh, these are some of the things that people in Europe don't see because, you know, eating patterns in poultry, for instance, has changed. Uh, in Europe, people eat the white meat. They don't eat the brown meat, the bone-in chicken pieces. As a result, they sit on a mountain of the stuff. And what do they do when markets like Russia close their markets? Uh, they simply go and sell it at any price they can get. But of course, it doesn't reach the consumer at that price, right? It's not as though the consumer benefits. The consumer pays marginally less than the price they pay for South African chicken. Uh, and in the process, South African producers are put under pressure. And you know what happens? It's not the big producers who suffer most. It's the small producers. Small black producers go out of business straight away. It's the same in the sh sugar industry. When there's pressure on the sugar price, it's not the big producers who go out of uh, business. It's the small black farmers who go out of business. And that's why we're very worried about the effect that these trade practices have. The fair play movement is not against free trade but we are for the rule of law. And unfortunately, the World Trade Organization is geared for the big people, right? Mm. Big corporates, big countries who abuse their market power and force producers in smaller countries out of business, and then they can charge whatever they like. Uh, so in Ghana, for instance, they've done that very successfully. There's no Ghanaian chicken industry of any uh, substance left. Uh, the scale has become very small. Why? Because people were able to uh, export to Ghana unfettered. Now, we don't think it makes sense, for instance, for Europe on the one end to spend millions of euros supporting development in Africa to try and create jobs and then spend million, millions of euros on subsidies to a farming sector that destroys jobs and food security. On chicken, for instance, people, people say, yes, but what about the US? Yes, they dump in South Africa, but they've actually made an agreement to say, we'll, we'll contain it to 65,000 65, tons, right? Which is nothing. So it's possible for governments to actually be responsible. The EU is irresponsible. And at the moment, the EU is not a big player, but 40, Imports are now 40% of the market in South Africa. It's the biggest producer of chicken. When you speak about the South African poultry industry, you're actually merging two things that seem to be quite far apart. You spoke about the little black um, producer and the big poultry industry that was just reported that it was more productive than even the European. The issue is not competitiveness. Of course, the big producers will be very competitive. They have the latest technology, they keep up with world standards, and in fact, as I explained earlier, the packaging and hygiene uh, requirements are very high. But remember how they remain competitive and how they solve the problem. They have to cut jobs. 
And that's what first got us into this. You know, when I realized that in some areas in South Africa, where these chicken uh, production uh, facilities are, unemployment is over 40%. So if you lose a job there, it's not as though you can walk down the street and find another job. There is nothing. And when we started doing some research in the local communities, we found that all the negative indicators are growing. So family violence, uh, lack of school attendance, all of these things started tracking exactly when they shut the production facility down. So yes, on the one hand, it affects small farmers most. They go first. Right? Because this is a dynamic situation. It's not as though they started uh, uh, overnight. First they test the market, they get away with it, then they dump in the market. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, three European countries have been found guilty of dumping chicken in South Africa. Germany, Netherlands and the UK. So it is not as though we are fighting a, a, a sort of tilting at windmills. The problem is, what is the punishment for dumping? There is no punishment, effectively. The process at the WTO is so slow. You can be found guilty in 2013 or 2014, and the first time a real tariff is raised against you is in 2018 by which time thousands of people have lost their jobs. Uh, that is simply unacceptable. So we are for free trade, but free trade according to the rules. And what we're saying is you don't necessarily need more rules. You need tougher enforcement, punishment, faster enforcement, and faster processes. Because, you know, while they are sitting dozing off at the WTO in Geneva, People are scrambling to try and keep their jobs in Africa. And that is simply not compatible. The WTO is not, not really guilty, but guilty of neglecting and not getting involved. But there's other governments. There's the trading blocs, there's the US, there's uh, Europe we spoke about. And there's also the South African government, because obviously there's somebody responsible for letting the stuff in. You know, what I've come to realize over the last two years is that there's a reason why government is not called management. Uh, because, for instance, the South African government had a lapse in applying the appropriate sugar tariffs for several months, about 18 months ago, last year. As a result of which, you can imagine, the big corporations were right in there taking advantage of the, of the lapse on the side of the government and we were forced, as Fair Play Movement, to take on Coca-Cola about, about walking through that door. Uh, you, in a sense, you can't blame them, because they're not doing something illegal. And that's part of the problem. Dumping is not illegal. Dumping is simply frowned upon. So now the South Africans have, uh, the South African government has imposed a higher tariff on sugar and a higher tariff on chicken, for three years and it will decline again, but it doesn't solve the problem. This problem must be solved by, firstly, applying the rules of dumping more strictly, being faster about it, and I think the sanction should be much, much, much higher, because if you do this, it's not by accident, it's deliberate. So if you're a businessman and you know you're going to be selling below your uh, local selling price or below your cost of production, it is only because you're colluding with the government. You know, there's an old joke. They say in Africa, the farmers farm the land, but in Europe, they farm the government. And it's because politicians quite naturally want to get votes and they go for the easy win. But the world has changed, and we can see worldwide, for instance, the impacts of these decisions are now coming home. Uh, immigration from Africa has become a problem for Europe, but that's because of European trade policies and aid policies not creating 
business and jobs and economic growth in Africa. Maybe you can clarify who is responsible on each side. The African governments, why are they not closing the door? It's not, I guess it's not just sort of slowness in response. It's also a structural thing that they trading basically, maybe it's a wrong word here, but that they they're juggling different things when they want to talk to the big guys in the US and Europe. They want to have certain contacts. And who's taking the brunt is the, the small farmers. You put your finger on the problem. It's big versus small. So if you're small government, even South Africa is a small government compared to the European Union. So when you negotiate with the European Union, do you know what they do? They say, well, if you don't allow us and you don't look the other way so that we can dump chicken, we're going to stop your wine from coming in. So it's brutal. And I think that brutality is what's hurting Europe. So there has to be a realignment. Europe must decide whether it wants to be a moral player in the world, whether it wants Africa to be successful, and whether it is going to be more reasonable and sensible in dealing with smaller countries. A country like Ivory Coast, for instance, the moment they closed their market, their local industry recovered. South Africa doesn't have to close its market, but the same rules must apply. The same packaging, traceability. For instance, South Africa has just had the deadliest uh, case of listeriosis, the biggest listeriosis uh, case in the world. Nearly 200 people died. The question is, where did that deadly strain of listeriosis get into the food chain? Could it be that it came in product from Brazil, for instance, where we know they're extremely corrupt and extremely uh, uh, unreliable when it comes to food safety? And it's not because we think so, it's because they themselves have arrested people and thrown them in jail for those offenses. So this is not make-believe, this is a real issue. And so if it's a real issue, the government has to play its role. And so uh, this is not a simple silver bullet, you know, we're going to do one thing and everything changes. What you have to do, and that's what Fair Play is, is trying to get everyone to do, is to say, firstly, in Africa and other developing countries, the local governments must coordinate their departments better, for instance, food safety agency. They must come up with innovations. I'll give you a practical example. <laughs> Why would Africa, with a big sugar industry, import sugar-based packaging. It should be making it themselves. Why does every country not have an ethanol mandate? Uh, the South African government has had an ethanol mandate lying on the shelf for five years now. When will it be implemented? So it's execution on the side of African governments. It's policy on the side of the big trading blocks. And it is coordination and ensuring that there's a way of speeding up redress and assistance to the victims of dumping and other predatory trade practices so that you create a more competitive free trade uh, world where the small countries, the small producers are able on an equitable basis to compete against the bigger countries. You can't have a situation where a competitive industry is destroyed due to policy. You have to create a situation where a competitive industry is able to compete on a level playing field. And that's all we are saying. We're saying the same rules applied with sensible approaches and coordinated policy so that development takes place in the smaller blocks and that they're not bullied into destroying their own business uh, by the big players. So you're basically asking you need more of an international governance system that's more transparent and that shows what's actually happening. So actually the profits are shifting in a way to big corporations somewhere and you can't really blame them because the level field is not playing, there's not enough signs on that playing field that regulates it in a way.
Illinois. So maybe you can you can speak a little bit more about the whole cause of events that you sort of sketched in the beginning with the what's the big thing is the the root causes of migration. That's where everybody seems to be scared about all of a sudden for the last three, four years. I mean Trump now blocking the borders, calling in the guards and how do you see that? What what's happening? What's the cause of events until these people stand and want to cross the border? sort of follow where the prophets are going. The president of Ghana pointed out that young Africans in high unemployment areas have always migrated to find work. Right now they're migrating to Europe. The Europeans are very worried about receiving Africans, whatever the basis for that worry may be, but they don't want Africans flooding Europe. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I'm not going to get into the politics of it. All I'm going to say is from a fair play movement perspective, if you don't want people from outside your borders flooding your own country in search of work, it would be a very sensible thing to assist them to find work in their own countries. Our patron is Justice Richard Goldstone, who was the first prosecutor at The Hague. Yeah, I remember. Um, and he made the case that there needs to be a legal route to find faster redress. Uh, because, you know, should dumping not be illegal? In the last couple of years, what I've been thinking about is that the typical way of doing politics is the legal route. I mean, parliaments make laws, internationally you make trade agreements, they become laws in a way even. What do you think? Is, is there maybe a time where you need to find a different way of actually setting up, moving things in politics? I mean, on a small scale, you have behavioral considerations. How do you actually nudge people to do what you can't really force them to do? How about international things? Is it about naming and shaming? Is that going to work? Is yeah, this sort of thing? You know, we, we would like to see more transparency. It would be nice to find out who actually makes the money here. Because someone is making a lot of money for very little effort, aided and abetted by government aided and abetted by African governments, by developing country governments, and by the uh, country of origin government. Aided and abetted by policies that enable these enormous profits for no value added, at the cost of jobs in the developing world. So transparency would be good. But we think there's also a case to be made to say, if you're going to have regulations and there is no real sanction. We all know that doesn't work. So I think it is a basket of solutions that we have to look at. And I think it's time to take it more seriously. And I think it's time for the World Trade Organization to actually pitch up for work for once and work on behalf of the smaller nations and the smaller, the smaller producers looking for new ways to assist smaller producers. For heaven's sake, the world is full of technology now. It must be possible to create value chain traceability. And once you have value chain traceability, a lot of this, these problems could be managed much better. So we think it's time for the global trade system to be shaken up, to be better enabled with technology to become more transparent and certainly to become a little more aggressive in dealing with transgressors. So the regional trade, intra-African regional trade initiatives, that's not going to really crack the nut in the long run? Is it just a small wave? You know, big and small will always be in, in uh, adversarial positions. So even intra-African trade, when you have the big African countries trading with small African countries, they also abuse the, the, the system. That's why I believe technology 
uh, traceability, all of this will assist. And by the way, just think about it. Proper traceability in the, in the developing world and developed world across the globe of value chains will actually make your food safer, will ensure that you know where it comes from, who produced it, how they produced it, will ensure that when you have uh, trade moving into countries and out of countries that you know who's behind it uh, and what that trade is actually worth. So there's an enormous benefit to bringing technology into play here. Uh, and we don't think enough has been done with that. What about digitalization? I mean, there is huge money flows there with Amazon, Netflix, all these sort of things in the media business that we see. How does that affect agricultural trade in a way? Do, do you, is there something on the horizon, maybe with dark clouds even? Actually, I think there's a very exciting possibility. And that is that if you bring value chain traceability through technology, which is digitization, into the market, what you're going to have is transparency. So the cotton industry in South Africa, for instance, brought value chain, chain traceability in with technology. And they have grown their revenue from 21 million rand to over 3 billion four years later. Why? Because all of a sudden, everything was transparent. Costs went down across the value chain and consumers responded very well because you can now go to the store and see where your shirt comes from. Where was it produced? Where was the cotton produced? Who did the weaving and the spinning and the design and everything that went into it? So once you get value chain traceability, I think a lot of these problems can be solved, provided governments are willing to also enforce the rules on a fair, equitable basis. So financial flows as well? Or is that maybe pushing it too much? No, I think financial flows as well. Uh, it's free trade. We're not saying stop people from trading. We're simply saying make sure that it's transparent. Make sure that you know how the finances are flowing, who's making the money. And if there is gouging, price gouging, that's against the rules too. So, so start bringing transparency and then enforce the rules properly and punish the transgressors. Make it unprofitable to indulge in crocodile trade and eat jobs. Yeah.